Hi, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to our weekly Family Connections. Today we are going to be visiting with some of our special education staff members and talking through ways to uh, support our special ed and our special populations. So um, we'll start with some brief introductions and then just jump into some questions that we have uh, had submitted. Um, my name is Rachel McLean. I'm the Assistant Superintendent of Learning and Innovation with the school district. We have with us um, Jesus Gomez. He is our Director of Equity and uh, Inclusion and Diversity. If you need any support with language assistance, please uh, let us know and um, Jesus can support that. We have Valerie Morris as our Public Information Officer. And then we have two of our wonderful diagnostician staff members. And so they are all masked up behind there. Um, so, and then we also have Jerry Russell. He is our head of schools at Snyder Junior High is joining us today. So um, ladies, I'll let you introduce yourself and then we will go ahead and get started. Okay. I'm Donita Nelson. I'm the diagnostician at the Intermediate Campus. And I'm Christy Smith, the diagnostician at this high school campus. All right, very good. Um, well, like I said, if you are it's in the chat, if you have any questions as we're going through uh, our conversation today, please feel free to pop them in the chat or in the Q&A feature, and we will try to answer as many of those questions live as possible. Um, and let's go ahead and get started. So ladies, diagnosticians, um, Let's just kind of talk about what resources the district and, and the different campuses have available to help our uh, students that maybe 504 special populations succeed in their classes. Okay, well, um, I'll start first. At the intermediate, we have, well, district-wide, really. I'm sorry, I, I feel like I'm muffled, but um, at, in the district level, we have really gone to a case manager, um, way of doing things. And that, that means that each one of our special ed kiddos is assigned a special ed case manager. And that case manager does exactly what that title sounds like. They manage that student's case. So if you're wanting to know how to help that child, how to help your child, the best place for you to start is to contact their case manager. At the intermediate level, the case managers are broken, out, broken out into grade levels. So Nathan Stevenson does our fourth grade uh, kiddos and Julie Villanueva does our fifth grade kiddos. And so they, they really work hand in hand with our general ed teachers to make sure that the kids are learning, if they need to have anything retaught, if they need to come down to take a test, if they need to make up assignments, they are integral in um, contacting the parents and making sure that the parents are involved and understand what's going on in their kiddos education and if there needs to be any additional support at home. Other than our case managers at every campus, um, I know at the junior high, the high school and the intermediate, we have tutorials uh, that our general ed teachers provide that they can um, go to. Um, each teacher runs their own tutorial. So you would just need to make sure that you touch base with your um, child's teacher but you can also touch base with their case manager and they would be able to get that information for you. And then at the high school. At the high school, we also have something that's called Pride Hall in the after we do two days a week um, after school and two evenings. And that's where students can go and get extra support there through teachers um, with homework or take a test or anything like that. So that's offered about four days a week at the high school. So if we have students that are virtual and needing support, there's there's systems in place for our virtual students also. Um, do you want to talk about that for? Yes, and um, it's it's largely the same because our case managers are still um, in charge of that student's learning, whether they're virtual or in face-to-face. Uh, -face. So if your student is struggling with um, with virtual, then you would contact the, either the classroom teacher or the case manager to make sure that what is in place is what the child needs. And you know, anytime um, we try to anticipate what a child might need in the virtual um, setting when, we, when we're at an annual ARD and the student is in person and they might go virtual if they're you know, exposed or they come down with COVID. But if, if your child 
happens to go virtual for whatever reason, and what is in place is not working, then please contact us at the campus and we will be glad to uh, you know, call an ARD meeting so we can discuss that, uh, the student's plan again, because again, we're trying to anticipate what the child may need. And sometimes practice is way different than what we thought. So at any time you can contact the case manager, you can contact us um, and we can call another ARD and go back to the, the drawing board and see if we need to change anything. Okay, so if a parent thinks that their child is struggling with a learning disability, I think this is more of a, just a general question, not really a COVID related question, but um, what should a parent do if they feel like their, their child is struggling with some potential learning disability? I think the first thing that the parent should do is contact their uh, teacher and set up a teacher conference and then go from there. See if we need to put any other interventions in place, see if we need to, what the problem is, and then go from there. And then like the last resort, resort would be maybe a parent referral for special ed testing. But I would start with the teacher first. There's a lot of interventions between a student just sitting in a special tier one of RTI, just sitting in a classroom, uh, learning with the rest of the students. There's many general ed uh, interventions that we can go through and look at for each individual child before we get to special education. And we're not trying to, you know, say that special education testing might not ultimately be what needs to happen. But if RTI support can help a child, if a 504 plan can give child access to the learning environment better and they're successful, then that's what we're advocating would happen um, because we would not want to put a child in special education if a general ed intervention uh, is appropriate and would help that child succeed in education. So you mentioned 504, just for the, the benefit of our audience, what's the difference between 504 and special education and, and actually general education? Just kind of make those three okay. uh, differences. So general education is the education that every child would get walking into any school in, well, in the state of Texas, in the nation. So there, there's um, things that we do in a general ed setting, RTI, which is response to intervention. Um, we have instructional coaches that help. There's different uh, levels of general ed intervention that you might get in the general ed environment. If you have a disability that affects your ability to access your general, your general ed curriculum, that is where 504 would come in. So 504 is about accommodations to level the playing field so the student can access their learning environment. So if a student had, uh, uh, let's say a hearing impairment and they needed access to um, sit closer to the front of the classroom, they needed the teacher to get their attention before they started speaking to them, then those things can be provided through 504. However, if that same student with the hearing impairment needed services and devices, so maybe they needed an FM system, Maybe they needed audiological services. Maybe they need services from an auditory impairment teacher. That's where special ed comes in. So special ed is about services and devices and equipment that is not provided through 504 or um, general ed. Okay. Um, so we had a parent, uh, their child's been sent home for virtual school. So this, I, would, this would be a student that was in class and due to COVID exposure, they've been sent home from virtual school. They're not sure what to do to get support for uh, their students' classes. So what is the best recommendation for specifically our SPED students, uh, special ed students um, that might need some uh, assistance on, on what to do during you know, a COVID exposure or during a COVID illness? Okay. Um, and we've really at the intermediate level tried to work through this, um, procedure. Um, there are resources. Several of our teachers have uh, made recordings um, to show a, a teacher or show a parent, excuse me, how to get on a Zoom, um, a Zoom meeting, how to access all of the different platforms that the students uses. Um, so that's available. We also have some, um, a folder that has different things in it that are resources that the parents can use we're trying to get together some folders that can go home with the student 
so that they have access to their supplementary aids, like their math charts, their multiplication charts, their blank graphic organizers, all of those things. We're, we've got them in the digital format, but we're working to, to get some folders made so that they can go home with our students. If we know that they're going home, we can send those home with them. If not, we can mail them. However, if for whatever reason, none of those things, none of those dominoes fall where they're supposed to be and you don't get access to those resources, then I would encourage you to contact your case manager or this classroom teacher at this level. At the high school Thanks. level, you're mostly gonna uh, contact your case manager because they'll be able to, to help you uh, facilitate all seven or eight of those classes that your child has. So and I would I, imagine at the primary, a similar process, contact the campus, contact the teacher, Jerry, uh, at the charter, do y'all have any different procedures if a, a special ed student, 504 student goes home because of COVID exposure? No, so our, our nurse has been reaching out as well as, um, as, well as one of the deans typically. Um, so one, somebody from the campus will let them know and then they can reach back out um, to the campus if they have any issues with while they're at home. Uh, more specifically, Ms. Maven, um, helps all a lot of our short-term virtual students in that regard. Um, so if they're looking for a specific dean, it would be it would be Miss Maven on that end. I'm putting into the chat um, the diagnosticians on each campus. Um, so uh, maybe we can make that available to the uh, parents, and then that way uh, they can contact. If you don't know who your case manager is you can contact um, your diag so that they can get you in the right place. Okay. So maybe as we're talking, um, make sure Donita to change it to panelists and attendees so our, okay. our guests can see it also. And then maybe just type in your uh, emails also in case okay. their parents are able to reach out to you that way, that'd be awesome. Okay, um, okay so students that are develop, uh, dealing with behavior issues, do we have any specific resources that might be available to help students uh, or help parents that are uh, needing some additional support at home and maybe support in, in school? Um, we have at each campus um, either a para who works with our behavior students or a teacher who works with our behavior students. And so if your student is, um, if they're in special education and they have a diagnosis that would allow them to be in a behavior classroom um, or to have access to that behavior teacher, that's who I would contact. So at the high school level, it would be Wayne Barnhouse. Wayne Barnhouse. So he is the behavior guru at the, the high school. Um, and then at the uh, primary and inter, uh, primary and junior high, it's Rob. And I oh. always get his name wrong, full. <laughs> And then um, here at the intermediate campus, we have Jessica Fennell. She is our behavior uh, para and she works um, very well with our students. So, um, and then our counselors have been also great um, about working with our kids with uh, issues that is causing them uh, to have behaviors in the classroom. So I would encourage parents to um, touch base with their teachers. And then to also, if, if they need more than that, to talk to uh, the, the counselors as well. I am also linking a um, website into the chat. And this is, um, this is a website that TEA puts out and it has um, resources on it that are, um, it's, they have general resources to help your student in the classroom. They have uh, things about the pandemic, the uh, coronavirus to help during that time learning at home resources that it has behavior resources on there. So there's a lot of different resources um, in that, in that, at that website for uh, parents to go to, um, to also get help with their child that has behavior issues. Okay, great. Yeah, there's a lot of resources on that side. Um, just a general question about how parents can see student grades and attendance. And so I, I can, um, I think we popped up in the chat earlier, but we can pop it in there again, our links to our previous Family Connections um, about how to access Schoology for uh, primary, intermediate, and high school. 
and ways to check student grades and attendance in Skyward. And then our junior high, we have a previous family connections that talks through Bright Thinker and how to access Bright Thinker. And so those are great, um, those are great uh, family connections to go back and visit again uh, because it walks you through um, how to access those parent resources so that you can check your students' grades and attendance. And I mean, why is that so important um, from a special ed uh, standpoint, especially that our parents are heavily engaged in their students' um, academic progress? Um, well, I'll answer it from this level. Um, and then if Chrissy has anything to add, um, we have done uh, several uh, trainings with our staff about executive functioning. And executive functioning is that those skills that kids develop as they get older. Uh, uh, girls tend to develop it by the time they're 19 or 20. Boys tend to not develop it until they're 28 or 30. So these are the skills that help us organize, help us um, manage tasks, help us focus, help us uh, maintain attention. And so when you've got students, um, your general population, they're gonna struggle with these tasks. And it's all the tasks that drive teacher crazy, not turning in assignments, not getting their projects done, not chunking their assignments, not, you know, they don't, they just can't maintain a schedule to keep them um, on the level with turning in their assignments. And so um, what we've noticed is that our SPED kids even struggle more with that. So um, our parents need to be involved in their day-to-day -day learning because they need help with those skills. They need help knowing what the assignments are. They need help to be able to put it in their assignment notebook. They need help to be able, when they get home, to be able to say, this is not due till Friday. I don't need to work on it tonight, but this is due tomorrow. I need to work on that. And so it's just these skills that if parents are engaged and they know what um, assignments the child has, and they can also look to see what assignments the child has not turned in, then those that can only help us to help their child more because as a team, we can come together and work together to keep those kids caught up with those assignments. And that's the same way possible, just staying on top of it, helping those uh, special ed children navigate those assignments and when they are due. Attendance is also important um, because at the high school level, they need to be able to, they have to attend so many classes or they do not get credit, even if they pass those um, academic classes. So they, they could be denied credit. So just getting them to school and then staying in on top of their assignments would be helpful. And what we've, what we've seen and what we're trying to um, curb is that the kids get to week five, day four, it's the last day of the six weeks and they come to you and say, I've got 25 missing assignments. And, and at that point, our hands are kind of tied. We're, we're, you know, and we're working with our case managers to not allow that to happen. But if parents are also watching it, if we're watching it from the school perspective and the home perspective, then we can't help but to, to benefit these the kiddos and, and keep them on target. Definitely, I agree. So we let's, let's talk about what is a failure art and why is it important that parents attend these failure arts? Uh, failure arts is when we have a special ed student that has failed at least one class or more and we come to uh, our meeting as a committee and we determine what the next step might need to be with that student. We identify the problem and then we make re recommendations and we may be changing the IEP. Uh, we may be adding an accommodation. We may be adding um, modification depending on what the problem is. Uh, in some cases, it's as simple as adding an assignment tracker and having those kids um, fill that out on the high school level and keep track of that. Um, but that's what a failure art is. It's a brief meeting, about 30 to 45 minutes. And uh, usually the parents participation is very important on this because they help us. They're part of the team to get this accomplished and hopefully they would pass the next six weeks. 
And what we're trying to get away from is we do not want students to fail grading, grading period after grading period after grading period. And if the IEP that's written on paper is, is not being successful, if it's not what the child needs, then we need to come back to the table again and readdress what is going on, what, what is not, what piece is not right that we need to change so that we can help this child be more successful in their education. So we've seen this more, actually a lot this year, um, especially at the high school level where we have, um, you know, we, with obviously we have a virtual program that students can access because of COVID. And, and then we have um, some families that have elected just to attend school virtually full time. But we do see not just in special ed, but in, in general, we see sometimes teenagers might not want to get up and come to school and they opt to go to virtual. Uh, but then the, a lot of times they're not really participating virtually. And so it's kind of a, you know, a, a endless cycle. So what can a parent do if their teenager is not wanting to come to school, they're having a hard time getting them to come because they want to attend virtually, but then they're not doing their work virtually either. So any suggestions? The only suggestion I have with that is that I would encourage those parents um, to call Mr. Murphy at the high school level. Um, well, to call the principal at any level, call Mr. Russell. Um, and we need to set up a meeting with everybody that's involved with that student so that we can maybe determine, um, is there a reason that child is not wanting to come to school? Is it, you know, if you've got a high school kid who's a 10th grader reading on a second grade level, and they're, it's a, I'm just gonna say a beating from the minute they walk in the door until the minute they leave. And there's no reprieve from that. At some point, all of us, even as adults would say, you know, I think I can <laughs> go find something better to do. So um, we want to make sure that um, if, if a kid is struggling, that it's not because of something inherent in the school um, environment that is making it to where they don't wanna come to school. Um, I also, we have one student that is struggling at the high school right now to come to school and he has a great relationship with his case manager and that case manager can get him to come to school when no one else can get him to come to school. And so I just say, let's start with a team meeting. Let's all get around a table and let's talk about what can we do from a school perspective to help that student want to come to school, want to feel successful. Um, we've got to find ways to make these kids feel successful so that they want to come to school and do the hard things. Because if it's just failure after failure after failure after failure, at some point they're going to go find something else to do. Okay. So uh, Jerry Russell is our head of schools at um, our junior highs, our charter partner operator. So um, Mr. Russell thinks look a little different on the junior high as compared to the other campuses. So thought you might wanna talk through um, just some tips, resources that are available to help uh, our parents support their students in catching up on any missing work or just talk through that. What, what are the options and what looks different on the junior high this year? Okay, um, so so there are a few, a few differences. Um, the first one being, you know, all of our students had the, the ability to um, go back in and recreate assignments for full credit. And so, um, you know, if, if a child, for instance, was unsuccessful in the first six weeks of school and, and failed with a below 70 average, they can go back in and redo those assignments um, for full credit and, and eventually um, get that get that credit back. And so, each six weeks is not a is not a standalone six weeks from that perspective. Um, you know, we we encourage our parents to get into Bright Thinker, um, to to sit down next to their next to their child and have their child show them how to, uh, you, you know, have their child log into Bright Thinker and then look at their child's grades. It shows when they submitted things, whether or not they were late, how much time they spent on them. Uh, we even have a, a what if section in Bright Thinker so they can go back in and and plug in, you know, a, a grade and say, you know, if I get up to this score, uh, that'll give me credit. And so, uh, you know, we if a parent needs help with that side of things, uh, please feel free to reach us here at the junior high. Um, I also know that 
we are planning on scheduling meetings with our special education parents um, so, uh, of our special education students so that we can show them that in a, in a deeper format um, to hopefully help them guide their child um, while they're at home uh, and, and kind of see how they progress throughout the day, where they spent their time, how they spent their time, um, as well as as well as just continuing to provide the resources here at school uh, through our win period, through tutorials, um, through those other areas as well. So do you want to talk just a little bit about what the academy program is and um, and what that means if, if a parent has a student that's in the academy? Sure. So our academy is is a mixture of all of our of all of our students, whether or not they have disabilities or not. Um, we have um, students who were virtual um, who came back on the campus and were significantly behind. And so their parents and, and the child, um, we have meetings with them and, and we determined that that would be a better placement for them. Uh, during that time, they don't have electives. And so they have more time to work on their core subjects, uh, as well as um, you know, if a student wants to get ahead of the class and wants to go ahead and get, uh, you know, further their course, course studies, um, we do have some students in there that are already in the high school credits and those sort of things. And so they completed all the work for the year and then moved into the next grade level. Um, you know, right now it's a, it's a very fluid room, um, but we, we've actually opened up a second room for an academy so that we could kind of split our kids a little bit better. So we have sixth and part of seventh and one, and then the other half of seventh and eighth grade and the other. Um, and that's kind of helped us really just kind of get our numbers down so that we could focus a little bit more on each individual student. Um, we do have personnel in there all day. The teachers go down there. Um, and so we, we have a lot of, of great things happening in that room. But really, it's about helping kids develop goals, help, helping them um, create a learning path. Um, and then ultimately just just start to backfill all those assignments that they'd originally missed when we started off the school year. Okay. Um, so just stress again, if a child has a failing six week grade, first six weeks, second six weeks, third six week, that's not it's not done, right? They can always go back. That's right. They can they can redo any any and all assignments for full credit. So I think that's the biggest mind shift at the junior high because the way we've always done traditional school once this grading period ends that's it that's what you're living with but that's not the case at the junior high so lots of lots of opportunities and i will say that that has been our biggest battle um with our students is is um getting them to go back and, and redo an assignment that they were not successful on um you know and and so just, i would encourage parents um they're talking to their child that if they they were unsuccessful on something um you know have them go back and redo that they can do that here at school they can do that at home they can do it on the weekend they can do it over holidays um we've opened it up to where we would be available basically 24 7 um to be able to make sure that they could get that work uh, redone for, for a, a grade that would get them course credit. All right, perfect. So we have a question about how safe is school if I send my special needs students to face-to-face -face classes? And so Valerie, I thought you might just talk briefly about where our, um, where our numbers are and how parents can access that on the, on the dashboard. Sure, um, you can find it anytime our current cases with students and staff on our website. You can go to SnyderISD.net and look under the family and students tab. About a third of the way down, you'll see COVID report and protocols. There you'll see exactly the COVID activity um, on the campuses. And it's broken down by primary, intermediate, junior high, high school um, students and staff. So you can look at that at any time. Um, we've been very pleased as far as what we're seeing um, with the lack of spread within the school. We do extensive contact tracing anytime there is a case uh, to see if we can find out where they acquired that, um, to identify any students that may have come into close contact with that student. And close contact is um, six feet or less, 15 minutes or more. And then we take into consideration whether or not the students uh, or staff member was wearing their mask properly. Um, I have been on campus and I have been so impressed, even with our little ones, 
with how well they're wearing their masks. Um, I'll tell you what, kids are resilient and I have just been blown away. Um, but there are some and they struggle and um, for whatever reason, so we always look at that to find out, but we have not um, been finding that it's spreading within the school. Um, a lot of times, like right now, when we have a larger number of cases, um, which we were down for a bit, we've come up a little bit, but it'll happen among families. So you've got siblings throughout each school that have it. Um, it's not that you have um, a widespread um, event. It is siblings across our, our district that live together and have it. So um, we've been very pleased. If you ever have any questions about it, feel free to give me a call. Our campus nurses are doing a phenomenal job. Um, they're a resource for you as well and you can reach out to them too. Okay, thank you. We got one last question. We're on, we are out of time actually. Um, uh, TEA is offering some funding to help special education students and families. Uh, where can our families get more information about that? So I am going to link in the chat. There's actually a press release that Governor Abbott put out that gives a, a little bit of information about it. And then I'm also going to link um, in the uh, chat also the uh, where you go to apply. And just so our parents know, it's $1,500. Um, you can use it for tutoring services. You can use it for... Um, therapies like occupational therapy, physical therapy, uh, behavior therapy, but it's only for our kiddos that have low incidence disabilities. So our kids with intellectual disability, um, visual impairment, auditory impairment, orthopedic impairment, multiple disabilities, or autism. So if your, your kid has um, speech only or they have a specific learning disability only, then uh, your family would not qualify for the money. So it's $1,500, I'll link to it. You can go to that site, you can apply. And then I think it's open for a couple more months and then the uh, TEA will let you know if you've been approved. Okay, so Valerie is gonna add that to our website also because the chat will go away at, when we end this meeting. Um, but if you have more, if you have questions, do not hesitate to you know, check out the website or contact our special ed department um, and they can direct you to how to access those resources. I appreciate all of our panelists. Thank you so much for attending um, today and sharing information. Um, and we you know, want to partner with our parents and our schools um, and our students to make sure that all of our students are successful. So thank you guys. We will be back here at five this afternoon. Um, and talk about the same topic, but you never can tell when different questions come in. Uh, so please feel free to join us again. Have a great afternoon. Thank you all. Thank you.